with drugs. But today, nowadays, it's much more than that. Addiction is very wide range and it invades every house, every home. Every one of us is threatened by some sort of an addiction. I'm standing here not as a, uh, well, as a professional, but also as a potential addict, believe it or not, because everything around us drags us into becoming addicts one way or another. And uh, the elephant in the, in the room is the, what we call behavioral addictions, not drug addictions. Like I said, in the old days, the, the word addict signified a person that is uh, maybe uh, has certain characteristics that leads him into maybe the not very good upbringing, maybe the, the, the developing in a very not the best uh, circumstances or parents, uh, parenthood or uh, area. area, area. area. But right now, addiction involves every single person and it invades even our bedrooms. Um, why study addiction? Well, it's, uh, it's a disaster. It's a tornado that really circulates lives and pulls upwards to the person altogether. It begins very young in age and it can lead to severest forms of, uh, of problems all kinds. It can lead to death, it, it leads to mental illness. It can look, look exactly like a mental, mental illness. So a lot of emergency room visits would, uh, uh, would be related to addiction and people would be labeled with mental uh, disorders left and right, including severe forms like schizophrenia, psychosis, bipolar disorder, and none of that exists. It's only uh, addiction. And these disorders can stick to that person forever uh, get get them involved with many uh, unnecessary treatments, admissions, and um, all kinds of, of treatments uh, that can stay for life, while in fact the person is, doesn't have any of that. It can lead to medical problems. Uh, there's a lot of people, cocaine addicts, that can die from uh, from strokes, heart heart uh, attacks. Heroin addicts that well, heroin is not really life threatening, but it feels like it feels like dying when, when they are getting off of it. And all kinds of other behavioral addiction leads to um, at least social kind of death. And spiritual, of course. It takes total control of people's lives. And that's why uh, I chose the term tornado, because it it's circulates the entire um, aspects of, of life. Uh, I, wanted, I want you to look at the, the the, the definition, because the definition highlights certain areas that I want to emphasize. Uh, those are the, the, the words written in red, to give you a key. So the word compulsive means that it's out of control. There is a compulsion component. And then uh, it emphasizes that it's either a substance or a behavior. Okay, And then uh, it emphasizes that the person knows exactly how harmful it is. And not only how harmful it is, but it can cause death. So just by looking at that definition, what do you conclude when, in terms of how to treat a person uh, or help a person who is an addict? What do you conclude with that? Any idea? If you want to help an addict, what, what, which attitude would you take based on that, which, uh, on that term, uh, terminology or uh, definition? Yeah. I guess I'm definitely not trying to convince them that it's wrong. Very good. Why not? Uh, because apparently they know. Yeah, it's part of the definition that they know that it's wrong. Right. Very good. What else you don't do? Yes. Oh, I was going to say you just kind of let them see that they can live without it. Like, because if it's an addiction mm -hmm. um, and they feel like they need it because they don't understand why they're doing it, then they just need to see that they can live without it. Okay. Well, that's from the definition. Yes. <laughs> Give it to the professional. Because it's beyond, uh, it's beyond uh, just stopping, right? It's, the word compulsive doesn't, it implies that it's beyond to, to just give that simple advice of stopping. You know, come on, stop smoking, this is dangerous. So they come on, stop uh, doing this behavior because it's taking your life. But it's beyond that, it's a compulsive, right? So just from the get go, from the definition, we gather some information about how to deal with this uh, person. And I'll give you an analogy here. If you are in a swimming pool and someone is drowning in a five feet, you know, uh, that deep uh, pool. Um, would you stand out there and say, "By the way, you're going to die"? Doesn't make sense. Because that kills them. But you know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, from what from your words rather than from from, from the, the fact that they're drowning. Because they, they the last thing they need to know is that they are really actually sinking. 
they, they are known. They, they know it is a city. So it's beyond just telling them that they are dying. And also, uh, you, you don't stand out there and say, it's, uh, by the way, you can't swim, or uh, come on, get out, or things of that, that nature, or you're wrong, or you're bad boy because you're drowned. All of these kind of things we don't do. It needs a lot of, uh, uh, much more than that. The, the big question that leads to the message that I said in the beginning, the message is that whether this belongs to God in any way, or is it be belongs to science? That's the biggest question of the field. And if you pick any book from about a picture from any library, you will either find one of those extremes. You most likely, yeah, you will want, if you if you pick a, a scientific book, it will be taking the extreme of that this is all belongs to neurologists, psychiatrists, addiction specialists, and it has nothing to do with spirituality, it has nothing to do with a Buna or with God. Um, and it, it's actually a pretty bad fact. Uh, just listen to the, the the National Institute of Drug Abuse, uh, Muslim head. Uh, it would be geared towards that this is science. Get off uh, you guys that say this is uh, behavioral. Get off that because it's destructive to say that. And this is all in the brain, and it's a brain disease, and you need to, uh, to treat it as such. On the contrary, the other extreme, if you talk about a theologian, and you, you would have books about that. I have tons of books about addiction from from church and taking the other extreme. It, is, it has nothing to do with science. This is a God, uh, return to God kind of situation. And what need, that we need here is repentance. Uh, we need some uh, uh, saving grace to, to, to get that person out of the addiction. Um, so let me ask you now, is it the sin or the disease? You think? Yes. Okay. Okay. That's the most common scenario. And why are you saying that, or somebody else? Why do you think that could be the situation? Why did you say that? I was just thinking about physical drugs. Yeah. Drugs or anything else? Drugs are like the normal things that we grow up when we, when we choose that as our focus is to keep God, becomes something that we can do, and then it turns our body then becomes like a new yeah. of it. So it starts off as a choice, that choice that can lead into lots of control due to damages that happen in the brain. I would go into that in a minute, in a minute. but uh, that's, it, you can say that it starts off as that's an easy, the easiest answer to say it starts off as a sin and then it goes on to be a disease. But it, it actually interacts all through. Yeah, it's, I agree with you, but but doesn't it's not as simple as, as it is phrased like that. It continues to be a, a mix because the sin also is a chronic sin and the disease it's, becomes a chronic disease. But then what kind of disease are we talking about? Don't lose your focus. What, what kind of, of a disease? Is it a... Physical, mental, psychological, um, spiritual, social, all of the above. Addiction develops as a tornado that circulates all these kinds of aspects around the person. So four components. You see that three, um, three cycle, uh, circles, the body, the mind, and the spirit. All created by our creator. Created our body, which has a brain that thinks and has emotions, what we call the mind, but also he breathes his soul into it that interacts with him. So all these three spheres are created by God. God has to do with this, including the brain that the science people are saying, oh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's only a brain disease. Well, this brain is created by God. So the body, the mind, and the spirit, they all get affected. So um, four components of, uh, of human life are the biology, which is the brain kind of chemistry, and, and, and physics, physical appearance and stuff. And then the psychological, which is the function of that brain, the mental function of that brain, the emotions and thoughts and stuff. And then the social components, which is the behavior that that brain uh, leads us to behave. And then also the spiritual world, which is like the sin, uh, the disconnection from God. So it's a horrible disease. It's not, it's more, own, it's more than, than a, an answer of both. You can say, yeah, both, it's a sin and a disease, but it's, it's more than that because that disease, that particular disease, is very complex. 
It includes the body, the, the mind, the, the social life, the spirit, everything. And that's why that image at the beginning, the tornado, now, we go back to that image. What is the best thing to do to flee that? If you're, if you're living here, right here, and this is moving this way, what is the best thing you do? Run. It's not enough to wait until it circulates you, and then it starts to think how to deal with it. So the best treatment, or if that, if that word, I mean, if that sentence applies, I don't think it applies, but if, if you will, the best way to deal with it is that you never fall into it. That's the best way. Uh, it's, it's a hard thing to deal with. Very hard thing. But yet, it's not impossible. So the, uh, the conclusion is a complex biopsychosocial spiritual disease and a sin. Okay? That's, uh, that's the conclusion of that. Really quick things that you already know. Uh, uh, this, this half of the screen is chemicals. This half is behavior. Um, the, the legalized stuff, the clean alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana, put it up now. So those are the legalized part. And then the illegal part, the cocaine, the heroin, the pills, and the citizens, and the prescription drugs, which is the epidemic right now in the United States. We have an epidemic of prescription drug use that has led to, to tremendous amount of uh, deaths among the youth. And it's not saving the Catholic youth. Uh, it's sad to say that I, I had experienced losses, tremendous amount of youth during the last couple of years to uh, prescription drugs, maybe maybe 10 to 15, ranging at the age of 30 to 40 or 20 to 40. Um, but there is, like I said, the element in the room is the behavior of addiction. Pornography is at the top. Sex addiction, gambling. Even the little things like internet, the TV, the video games, the food, and all of these kind of things are real. And they can cause changes in the brain. And they can cause even withdrawal kind of symptoms. Um, and I would never forget that many, many years ago when His Grace Bishop really called me and, uh, to see someone in the car. And it turns out to be a, a video game addict who's in medical school and dropped out. Um, and the family was like, they came to a point when they, 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 they had to, to remove the guy out, uh, out of the video games after he falls asleep with the food in his, in his hand. After 10 to 15 hours a day of, of uh, playing the game. And they had to lock up the video game thing in, in, a, in a closet. And, and the guy, that's when he got some withdrawal symptoms. More, mostly emotional withdrawal, psychological withdrawal. But it was real withdrawal. And that's when I got the call and when I was on together. So it is very real, behavioral addictions and its impact on the brain. Um, if you want to know how to prevent it, pay attention to these factors. When I say biological factors and I put some genes there, I don't mean that there is one gene that leads to addiction. There is no link to a gene that is called addiction. But the, the, the truth is that there are genetic predispositions, there are genetic mutations that happen that lead uh, to people becoming more prone to the addicts, and that's proven scientifically, especially with alcoholism. But if it happens with alcoholism because it's the most studied, it must be happening with everything else, and we believe that. There are people that are more prone to become addicts, but that does not mean they are doomed to become addicts. They can, with the grace of God, escape or flee that tornado. Psychological factors, pay attention to that picture, that guy, that image of somebody who's lonely, and uh, void from inside, void of love. Okay, that's a uh, high risk for developing an addiction. Especially in our society, when we go to social part, our society is, uh, is tem the temptations are surrounding us very, very easily. And it's giving us uh, a wrong conception of or understanding of freedom. And also the, uh, the idea of a quick fix that we live in. Everything now is by buttons and even by talking and things happen, you know, here in Manhattan, like the most uh, uh, you know, developed area in the, in the continent, the world, and this, everything is, needs to be done very on the tip of your fingers very easily. God did not make us to, to be like that. God created us 
that to to live by by more by by doing things, contemplating his presence and receiving his grace and waiting on things to happen. And uh, when we feel, feel lonely or bored and we, we want to quickly fix that, that, that makes us prone to become addicts, dependent on things that have quick fix and get us out of that uh, mindset or, or feelings. These are predisposing factors. Of course, uh, dysfunction for example, families uh, has part as well. Um, so let me take you through a quick review of how this tornado develops from those four aspects. Uh, the biological, we say it would be the biological, the psychological, and then the social, and that's the spiritual. How does that develop? Uh, the biological, I'm going to take you into a tour of medical um, knowledge way about this. Uh, it, the, the, the tornado of biological addiction starts by something called the first experience. You probably, as young professionals, know this stuff, so I'm going to go quickly. The first experience, and then it reach, gives the person a high, and then goes to a, a state of what we call abuse that develops into something called dependence. And that maybe explain what you said earlier that the first experience considered like the choice of the, the simple choice that we we do, and then when we get that high, and then starts to continue in that simple behavior that we're still in the area of sin because we're abusing our the creation rather than the, or, yeah, worshiping the creator. But then it develops, transitions into the dependence, which is what you said earlier, that we can't now, we're hooked, basically, and we can't, it becomes a physical disease. And we'll see how that works. So the first experience, you all know this stuff, Either seeking a quick fix from a, plot or a problem or trying to fit in with peers. Some people have difficulty in their social life and they want to feel sociable. It's very common. Or unintentionally with the prescription drugs. Now the pain management. Um, there, are, there are doctors that abuse that. There are doctors that prescribe for pain. But then these little pill bottles are staying on the shelves to be picked up by other people. Or that's the same person who has a knee problem or back problem and then gets flooded by prescription painkillers and then gets hooked. All of these are uh, could be possibilities of how to start. Then the high comes, and the high is a function of the euphoric effect of that substance or behavior on the brain. And, and uh, it depends on how fast that strength of a high that, that determines how the degree of addiction power of that substance or behavior. So things that cause very potent high and quick high are more addictive. Um, and it has to do with a specific area in the brain that is called the reward circuit. And uh, that's again, I want to emphasize this is God's creation. Okay? So that's the difference here. The difference is that when this is going to be picked up by science people, they're going to forget God at all, put them aside, and now we're talking about an entity of what, whatever they want to call it. Mother Nature or something that created this, or this is biology, this is science, science is our God, and we're talking about science. But no, we have to remember that God has put this together, and there are so many verses that tell us, Psalm 116, I believe, or I forgot the number, um, this is 119, there is a psalm that says that I have put you together in the womb, I have um, formed you, formed you and, and connected your bones together, and in, in the womb of your mom, mother. So God has put this together and, and the, the, the amazing uh, way of, uh, of God's creation in our cells and, and brains are, are beyond explanation. But let me tell you about this for now. I mean, uh, this is a cross-section of the brain. Each area of the brain has a function as you see. And this one in the middle, right in the core of our brains, is called the reward, reward circuit. And it's, uh, it's pleasure centers. He has, he has put cells in the brain that has no other function other than receiving pleasure. God did that because he wants us to have pleasure in him and connecting with him. So the father, the church father says that he put, he, he fashioned our bodies and he put, God put the soul inside of his body to worship him. And we say that in the, in the Tazbeha. There's a verse in the second host Lopsh or uh, that says he made man in his likeness and image that he may praise him 
He made man in his likeness and image that he may praise him. So from that verse you understand that the church fathers understood very early on that God has made this brain in his likeness and image, meaning rational mind, a mind that has authority, a mind that has freedom, only to worship him. So he put this pleasure sentence in there for a reason, and he put up put us up like this upright. We are the only creation that is put upright like this. Out of the, uh, the animal kingdom here. Yeah. Right? All the animals are looking down. We are put up like this. Our brain is high there to worship him. So he gave us this mind to praise him, connect with him. He gave us the intelligence to feed on his word. He gave us the, our emotions to love him and to feel loved by him. He gave us our willpower to submit to his to his will in our lives. Okay? These pleasure centers go from very deep inside of the brain. Here is the brain stem that has the reflexes that we share with insects. Right? The reflexes. Here is the nucleus accumbens, which is the emotional part of us that we share with higher level animals. And here is the prefrontal cortex that we share with humans. The intellectual, the most sophisticated human beings have prefrontal cortex with decision making. So you can see the pleasure center that takes all the brain and connects the brain. And that's the area that gets affected with addiction. That's where the tornadoes uh, start. So when the person takes that pill or drinks that cup or uses any behavior like uh, uh, sexual behavior or uh, looking at something, it hits this centers, right? But it hits it in an abnormal way using a chemical called dopamine. It that hijacks that area, it hijacks it. So look at what the dopamine is. The dopamine is in these vesicles up there, and it should be released to be connected with the other neuron, like here, from one neuron to the other. But look what the cocaine or any other substance does. It replaces it. So this is the green thing, it's like the cocaine. And instead of the dopamine, it replaces it, and it, uh, it connects with those receptors in the brain. And it gives a heart. And look at the... Uh, the, the, the chemical that is used to give the high school dopamine. Okay? So, um, is that boring? Okay. Are you connected with me? Okay, so this, this uh, circuit has receptors and it has dopamine vesicles that is released. Okay, and this dopamine, when it, when it connects, it gives a pleasurable feeling. And then it stamps in the brain and memory we call it an emotional memory that this thing that you just did is very likable. Do it again. That's called the reward. That's called the pleasure. Alas, God has made this for us to connect with Him. When we do the zbaha, see guys when they do the zbaha, they get excited, right? And you see the monks, and they spend like hours. And you see St. Paula and Babola, 70 years in a cave. He was not bored. The pleasure circuit was. Fantastically working, it's connecting with him. Yeah. So is our relationship to God some sort of healthy addiction? Yes, it's the healthy addiction. Yes. So that's a very good. Uh, that's a very good question because I want to coin that term. I want to coin that addiction is something is a phenomena that God had said for him. He put in place some circuit for us to get hooked to him. Okay, but we. If you read Romans chapter 1, read Romans chapter 1. He tells you this. The problem with those uh, Gentiles, he was addressing the Gentiles. The problem with the Gentiles, they didn't hear about God. So they, instead of, they, they had in nature, by nature, something telling them, God exists, look at the sky, look at the environment, look at the, he exists, he's so beautiful. But when they knew him, instead of worshipping him and thanking him, they fell into worshipping themselves and and St. Athanasius describes this process by, by leaving the Creator and looking down into the creation and starting to worshiping it. So he put in a system to be addicted to him, but we put him aside and we got that same system to be addicted to material. Okay? So look at the normal, the normal thing. But, but let, me, let me add something. He put this system to use it in relationship with him and also to use it in, in, in 
connecting with his creation, but from his hands. In other words, he put pleasure centers for us to be pleased by normal eating from his hand and by normal sexual relationship in marriage from his hand and blessing, from normal pleasurable activities from the creation, but relating it to him by, by thanksgiving and using the creation from his hand. Read the book by Father Alexander Schmemann, uh, titled Yes, the life of the world, which is uh, God sanctifying the world for us, as it was before, before sin. It was sanctified, because he created this whole world for us, but not to take the world and leave him. It makes a big difference. If we put him aside and we start using the world, then we're going to get addicted to the creation, creation rather than him. So, how does that translate to science? Look at the screen. This is the normal increase of dopamine when you eat, from 100 units to 150 units. But this is the way of increase of dopamine in your, in your brain when you use a drug, like amphetamine. It's from going from 100 to 1,000, 1,100 in, in a few minutes. That's not a godly use of, of the brain circuit, the pleasure circuit. I'm talking about the brain cells that I showed you, the pleasure brain cells, the circuit. The release of dopamine should be natural, like this, with food, sex, or whatever. Normal sex within marriage. But when you, when someone is addicted to sex, or addicted to pornography, or addicted to amphetamine, or addicted to cocaine, or whatever, you may name it. It's a different way of, of, a, of a, it's an abusive way of the release of this dopamine. Yes? Now, uh, when you mentioned uh, when the release of the dopamine, I mentioned it's safe in the memory, it's like a good feeling that you want to do it again. Right. But I also said it's a compulsive behavior that you know it has negative effect. How does the mind work this out? It kind of creates a cognitive dissonance. Like, you know, it's good. It's safe, it's good, but it's also bad. But it's like, it's cognitive dissonance, right? Like, yeah, so that, 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 that develops later when, when uh, in the phase of uh, dependence. The compulsion part, compulsive word, comes in the last phase of the phases of of addiction that I used uh, to describe. I said the first use, right, which is I'm still in, and then the abuse, and then goes to the dependence. So bear with me, and I will answer that uh, scientifically now. So that's the, that's the idea, that uh, the first use will release an exaggerated re reaction of dopamine release, and then it, it, it becomes to the brain that that's kind of the normal now, because the, if you're used to 1,100 units of dopamine from a use, and or you tasted that, and you want it again, you want it again. Now introduce something like that that, that, that gives you only like a 50 units increase, and it doesn't doesn't touch you, right? So your brain gets used to that abnormal euphoria, right? And that's what explains that the, the Alex goes into that dilemma of uh, disconnecting from everything, and nothing now makes any pleasure. The phase of the abuse in, is what, when, you, when the person starts to, to do this more and more and more, even with hazardous things happening, physical hazards, failure, major roads, like work, home, or school, recurrent uh, legal problems, uh, social problems, interpersonal problems, um, all of these start to, the person doesn't care. He just wants to do this more and more. That's still in the abuse. Then happens something that transitions into the compulsion. It's called neuroadaptive changes. What is neuroadaptive changes? It's when the brain starts to rebel against the person. Imagine that the brain is a person talking to that person, to the owner. Imagine with Nikita, the brain of that person is starting to say, no, I mean, stop. You're abusing me. The brain wants to shout to that person who's pouring this dopaminergic effect on him, and, and the brain is not, uh, is not uh, created for that. So the brain starts to uh, adapt. How does the brain adapt? Yes? I was going to ask, when does it start to shout? Does it shout like while, while the dopamine is being poured in, or is it when the, the mind is finally cleared of the drug or whatever it may be? Does it begin to like, negotiate with itself? No, it's a biological process, regardless of what's the state of that mind. It's a biological process that God has put in place, just like the, the, the development of the skin when you 
when you, let's say, when you, uh, it's an adaptive uh, biological process. Let's say someone who's working in, in the mines and the stones and stuff, the, the skin starts to thicken. Why? Because it's adapting to that kind of, of work. Uh, so I'm just using that uh, analogy of uh, the brain independently shouting back because it, it just highlights how that the, the brain wants to adapt to this abnormal uh, uh, use, an abnormal amount of dopamine. And the way it does that, it, that it shuts down the receptors. Remember the, the image of the receptors I showed you before? These receptors here? So let's say this is a neuron, which it is, uh, and has one, two, three, four, five re dopamine receptors in that one neuron, right? And it, it supposedly, normally, those five receptors get uh, triggered by the, the dopamine connecting to them. But then when this man is pouring like hundred folds of the amount of dopamine, uh, the brain, the only way to deal with this is to shut down some of those receptors. So they, the, the brain cells start to kick one after the other and leaves only one for that person. Why? Because you don't need that all, all dopamine. Yeah. Okay, you pour dopamine, I'll take away the receptors. I'll keep one receptor for each cell instead of ten. Right? And that is a physical change that happens in the brain. And what that causes is two things. One is called tolerance, which means that now that the person is pouring, like let's say, 10 cups of alcohol, or 10, what, what they call cups of uh, drinks, mm -hmm. 10 drinks of alcohol a day, right? But no longer it gives them the half. Why? Because the brain has decided to cut down on the alcohol receptors. So now I don't feel it. So what do I do? Drink more. They drink more, drink 10 times more. So, so, so. <clears throat> The body, God designed the body biologically yes. to stop it. Yes. But we just we keep adding more. We just adding more and getting ourselves destroyed more. And now there is a physical problem in the brain. But not only the tolerance. There is another problem called withdrawal. And that happens when, let's say, this guy, now an alcoholic dependent, alcohol dependence, uh, gets into a motor vehicle accident and gets admitted to the hospital unconscious. Now nobody knows that he's an alcoholic. Right? So it's unconscious. That doesn't stop the brain from being adapted to the alcoholism for years. Right? The brain only has one receptor now for called gather receptor for alcohol. So all of a sudden there is no tons of alcohol poured, right? For years this man has been drinking and drinking and increasing and drinking and increasing, pouring alcohol on the brain and now what? no no alcohol. He's unconscious in the hospital. Right? Nobody's <laughs> give him alcohol there. What happens to the brain? The brain now not only needs one receptor, but need, or, or even norm, normal, the 10, they need more because that is like drought. There is no alcohol whatsoever after 10 years of uh, giving that brain 10 times stimulation. Now there is nothing. So the brain goes into a vigorous demand of alcohol, a vigorous demand, not normal, but 10 times more because there is only one receptor to be stimulated, and there is nothing to stimulate that one receptor. That's called withdrawal. Withdrawal symptoms are physical disease. So now it's a disease. It's definitely a disease. It's a brain disease. Now, my initial message, do you remember it? What was my initial message? Yeah, God created the brain. This, having said that it's a brain disease like this, but yet, we can't say that the fix is only going to be medical because there is also a lack of finding of the creator connection to the need of the uh, of fulfilling this brain i'm just reminding you about message over and over the neuroadaptive changes were quite proven they put a, a cocaine addict in something called a machine fancy machine pet scan positron emission tomography it's a scan that measures the blood supply in the brain cells to see how viable it is. And they put a normal person here and a cocaine addict here. The normal person had blood supply in reddish areas all over the brain, but the cocaine addict was determined to have tissue that is fibers, this yellow uh, fibers. The brain has physically, physically deteriorated. So we have proof that the brain, that addiction is a brain disease. And also, not only the brain, the smoker's body has almost disappeared in this one. Here, this is a smoker body, and you can see that how it's almost blackened. Almost all the organs are destroyed by nicotine. Nicotine, by the way, is not a 
child of the feet. It's a huge monster. Nicotine is very addictive and very destructive. It's the silent killer. Okay, so the dependence phase uh, clinically is described here. There's tolerance, withdrawal, uh, taking larger amounts, persistent desire, much time and activity of, about. So basically, the, the drug or this behavior is the center of that person's life. That person, like instead of like what we aim for, which is be becoming God-centered or Christ-centered person, that person becomes alcohol-centered, sex-centered, this-centered. It's it becomes the center that this person's life will take around. It becomes a god, a god. It's a replacement for God. There's no no. I mean, it's point blank. It's a it's a replacement of God. God created us. To live by him. Remember St. Paul when he went to Athens and he found them putting this, the, the thing and saying, unknown God, and he said, I know this God. He's the creator. Bihi nahya wa natahara kwa Through him we live. Bihi nahya. With him we live. Natahara, we move. And nugat, we exist. So by him we live, move, and exist. By him. But in the addiction mind, it is by that substance that we move and exist, and we, that's why we're here. We, we circulating around that. Uh, that's just an, um, a diagram to illustrate what happens, what I just said. Normally, that's the brain settled with GABA receptors. When you do alcohol, you fill these GABA receptors like this, alcohol, 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 and then the brain kind of rebels and adapts, so it tilts that like that to, 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 uh, to normalize things by adapting, by cutting on the receptors and retains balance again. But with the alcohol, with the alcohol, okay? So instead of with God here, you're balanced, that person is balanced with alcohol. And then when you cut alcohol, with, you, you stay with the adaptation. The adaptation in the brain stays and it tilts back, which is what we call withdrawal. And then when we start to treat that person, we start to deal with this brain that is adapted, and it's, that's the heart. Uh, do, you have, do you have diagrams that show how the brain is physically impacted by behavioral addictions? Like, is it also the same effect, or is it not? Behavioral addiction, that's a very good question. Behavioral addictions are new phenomena in the field of addiction. Um, not relatively new, not very new, but relatively new. But where I practice in the University Hospital in, in, in New Jersey, the, the head of that department, Dr. Livonis, he is a specialized in behavioral addiction. He wrote a book about behavioral addiction that was just released a couple of years ago. So I thought, when I met him, I got that book. I read it because Bishop Karas wanted me to present another topic about behavioral addiction per se, because that's what really affects the youth. And, and to my surprise that all the behavioral addiction, yes, it does that, these changes in the brain, but the, the treatment is all spiritual. In the book, in the scientific book, not from, not the church opinion, it's the science opinion that, that how to get over behavioral addiction is the 12-step program. And if you look at the 12-step program, it's a typical program of an Orthodox Christianity. I will share a few slides at the end with that. Any other question? Yeah. Uh, for the post-acute for the controls, does it ever get balanced or will always be slightly? Yeah, like you say, we do our best chemically, but it, 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 it almost never comes back. The, the person has the potential for relapse. All of the course. Way. Huge potential for relapse. Of course. The tolerance and sensitivity, uh, this is uh, a phenomenon that I want to explain because it has to do with uh, why people overdose. So overdose with uh, opioid addictions. Uh, opioid is the uh, substance that is, um, that is present in the painkillers and morphines and heroin, okay? Um, this, this, this is the, uh, the epidemic that I mentioned, and this is why people die out of overdose, accidental overdose. I'm not talking about suicide overdose. You get that, right? You understand what I mean? There's a difference between I open, I take an overdose of suicidal, and that I, I end, end my life accidentally when I'm using drugs. So that's what we're talking about, the accidental overdose. Those are the ones that are staggering rates, and those are the ones that I mentioned that even our youth are affected with, accidentally. Okay, so how does that happen through this? I'm not going to read all of this, but I'm going to explain it. 
Tolerance and sensitization are two different things opposite each other. Tolerance, I already explained, you start giving the substance and the brain gets used to it and, and you need more to get the same effect. But the sensitization is, is the opposite. When there are cells, how does the overdose uh, happen and why? When this, the brain, some other cells get sensitized by using, it becomes more uh, responsive. Opposite to the tolerance. The tolerance is that with more use, it gets less stimulated and you need more. But the sensitization is with more use, it gets more uh, stimulation. So with opioids, it has two different roles. One on the opioid receptors, which is tolerance. It asks for more opioids to get the same eye. But on the back here, on the respiratory center, it gets sensitized. So the more you, you, you use, the respiration gets depressed. So put the two together, you, you, the brain asks for more to get a, the same high, while your respiratory center is asking for less because it's getting depressed. While the person doesn't understand that, doesn't feel, doesn't know. All what he does is that he needs more to get high, but the more he gets high, the more the, the respiratory center is, is a CNS uh, is depressing. Is it clear? And then once he goes, keeps going high, 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 to a certain point when the respiratory center stops. That's accidental overdose. Okay? Add to this that, that they cheat in the streets. Instead of selling heroin, they sell something called fentanyl because it's cheaper, but it's 10 times potent or 70 times more potent than heroin. 70 times. So you can take a bag of heroin thinking that you use the 10, 10 bags or whatever every day, but it's cheap. It's fentanyl, which is 70 times more potent. So suddenly it stops the respiratory center and they die. The craving is what uh, somebody here uh, mentioned that, or I think it was you when you said that he, he, he keeps in balance and he asks for it. There's a potential, the craving, potential. And this memory that was stamped uh, fires with any memory, uh, people, places, and things. The people that the person is using that drug or behavior with the places that they go and the things. So that was the biological part. The psychological part is this circle here. People go into stress, start to think about using, get obsessed about using, and then starts to compulsively go and indulge, then feel guilty, feel denial, and they go in a psychological uh, circle. The social tornado is that attempts, the person attempts to hide the addiction from family and, uh, and friends, which leads to dishonesty and guilt. Lying is part of addiction, unfortunately. And that's when the sins are compiling in each other, right? So even though, yes, now I'm, I'm uh, I, I do this compulsively, but I have to lie to, 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 to survive to this honesty and guilt, becoming withdrawn little uh, to reason with because the mind is focused on something else always. Strange behavior when you're either off, on, or, on or off the, the, the drug or the behavior. More use leads to guilt, leads to depression, sacrifice of personal integrity, relationships, jobs, keeps losing things. Addiction becomes the center of the person's life and all everything goes down here. That's the social uh, sad story. The spiritual part was described by St. Paul in Romans chapter 7 and also in St. James 1.14. Each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And, and when the desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and the sin when it's full grown brings for death. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process. But St. Paul describes, again, when you read this passage, you feel like St. Paul is an addict. If, you don't, if I don't tell you that this is St. Paul, you wouldn't believe it. You would think that this is an addict. He basically says, I'm doing things that I don't want to do. And I, something inside of me is making me do things that I hate and I can't control it. I can't stop. What a wretch man I am. That's what he's saying. And he's describing humanity without God. It's what St. Athanasius wrote in his book, The Incarnation of the Word, that humanity lost the image, lost the, the, the word of God that lives by, 
and humanity started to be addicted to desires and self, it became darkness. St. Paul says one sentence in the end of chapter 7 as a solution. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, because that's why God, God incarnated, that's why he came to fix it. He came to bury this old man, the wretched man, that is, and yeah, became hooked to material, buried in baptism, and gave a new man. And then he wrote chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 is the triumph of the victory. It's the most beautiful chapter in the whole, to me, it's my favorite, most powerful chapter. Romans chapter 8, and David doesn't open it. It's the freedom in Christ. Hmm? We call it the holy of holies of that of the New Testament. By living by the, the freedom of the Spirit, which is what we should be celebrating in the Holy Fifties, by the way. In the Holy Fifties, we celebrate that Christ conquered everything, victorious. Now he's resurrected. So no matter where we were in him, 